UFO researchers are always looking for the perfect case, the smoking gun that puts to rest any doubts that the encounter was real. The Coronado Hotel mass abduction of 1994 may come pretty close to fitting the bill. Let's explore. Hi everyone and welcome to Project Blue Book, your destination for all things unexplained. I am Thor and thanks for tuning in. It happened on March 14, 1994 at the historic hotel on Coronado Island just outside of downtown San Diego where Mike Evans and his wife were staying along with four other friends while attending a conference in three adjacent hotel rooms facing the ocean. It goes to show that it doesn't matter where you are when an abduction takes place. It doesn't have to be a remote cabin in the woods. It can happen in the middle of the city, in a hotel, in an apartment surrounded by other apartments. This is worth contemplating in context, as neither time nor space seems to matter when it comes to abductions. Their identities have been protected, including their pictures, so we won't show them here. In the middle room were Mike Evans and his wife Gina. In an adjacent room, Lori Angeloni and a friend that has never given up her name. We'll call her Nancy. And on the other side, Mr. and Mrs. Baxter, also a pseudonym, six in all. And that's what makes this case interesting the cross-examination and comparison of six people experiencing abduction at the same time and location. The first recollection is that of Mike Evans waking up with a bright light shining through the windows that he presumed was an airplane. He stood up to close the blinds. The next morning he saw blood on his pillow and his left ear had a puncture wound that he could not explain. Four of the six individuals had no recollection, while Lori instantly had memories of the abduction itself. She's in a rare group of people called conscious abductees that vividly remembers an abduction without hypnotic regression. They all felt slight symptoms of a flu and nausea, and as they reflected on the strange night, memories started emerging. Mike remembers the hotel room filling with white, hazy light, out of which several small gray beings appeared to come walking straight out of the wall. They had grayish skin and pointy chin, a classic description of the small grays that UFO researchers from comparative studies deem to be humanoid, biological robots, if you will, capable of all tasks, but perhaps void of the intellect or the id that tall grays possess. They are biological machines sent to perform tasks, is the latest theory, risking no consciousness possessed by other, larger aliens. They surrounded his bed, and that's all he consciously remembers. Laurie, however, remembers a bright light filling the room, and several gray small beings coming through the bright light. They had no clothes on, she recalled, a pale gray skin, large torso, and their arms and legs were like sticks, and they had huge heads and big round almond-shaped blackish eyes. She saw her roommate Nancy crying over on the other bed. She remembers jumping out of bed to pull Nancy to her on the floor and wrap her arms around her when one of the beings pointed towards her and Nancy instantly levitated back into bed and then out of the room altogether. Lori felt paralyzed, and then the room went dark. That's when she heard Mike Evans screaming in the adjacent room. Unable to move, all she could do was wait, try to stay calm, and moments later, Nancy was returned to her bed, and both fell asleep immediately. This introduces another aspect of abduction experiences, where the person left behind experiences a moment's passing, while the abduction experiencer tells a lengthy tale of medical examination, experimentation on board a craft, with the two timelines not matching up at all. 
This is very commonplace within the alien abduction syndrome. From Nancy's perspective, she remembers having a restless night, waking up with a bright light filling the room, having had a nightmare where she was being chased. In the morning, her bed sheets had been rolled up into a sausage, spanning the width of her bed, oddly laying over her neck and body, and stuck underneath the mattress on each side of the bed, as if done by someone who didn't have a clue what to do with bed sheets. Not at all how she placed it when going to bed the night before. She too had a flu-like symptom, nausea, and a headache. She later discovered a fresh scar on her leg she didn't remember acquiring. In the next room, Mr. Baxter didn't recall anything from the night, but felt odd and without energy the morning after. He declared he wasn't going to attend the conference at all. It was only days later that fraction of memories returned to him, remembering someone entering his room and he remembers a man screaming in terror next to him, without understanding how that could be. Weeks later, when they met up, they discussed the strange night and realized something profound had happened to all of them. And as more and more medical symptoms appeared, six months later, they agreed to undergo hypnotherapy regression administered by Yvonne Smith, who immediately instructed them not to discuss the experience with each other anymore, so as not to cross-contaminate their accounts. The regressions revealed more information and collaborative detail. Each remembered a praying mantis-looking being who seemed to be in control. This praying mantis life form has been described by others as one of the highest intelligence that can penetrate your thoughts it projects wisdom and compassion that cuts through the ages. It's been suggested by those who have interacted with them that they may be in charge of the grace, that they may be eternal or at least capable of living for hundreds of thousands of years. They seem to have a thorough understanding of humans, Earth's ecosystem, our evolution history as a species, as well as individuals, that they may have been tracking the same soul life forms for millennia through reincarnations and genetic manipulation if collected accounts of experiences are examined and mental projections compared. Mike Evans, under hypnotic regression, remembers the group of gray beings that entered his room having big black eyes that never blinked and had no irises. He was unable to move or protest as they took a long metallic instrument and placed it inside his ear. He saw his wife engulfed in light before she materially disappeared before his eyes. Moments later, he gained control of his body and instantly fell asleep. Mr. Baxter described the same black rod prodding his ear. His wife disappeared out of the room and he heard a man screaming. A moment later, his wife was returned to the bed and he fell asleep. Then comes the medical evidence. They had each suffered, to a various degree, a variety of physiological symptoms, flu-like symptoms, visible needle marks and puncture wounds on ears, abdomens, and feet, nosebleeds, spouts with high blood pressure, and occasional flare-ups of unexplained infections. Medical professionals have observed, as well as documented these effects thoroughly. It is in the record. Dr. Roger Lear, renowned surgeon who dedicated the latter part of his life to researching potential alien implants and was, of course, met with incredible controversy for this, he removed an implant from Nancy, described as a tiny bean-shaped object of mixed metallurgy, mostly found on meteors. The object he recovered emitted electromagnetic energy field and was fluorescent when put under an ultraviolet light. Additional oddity with this implant, as it is with others, they do not cause a reaction in the host, which is otherwise a common problem with human transplants, where the immune system sees the foreign object as an invader and reacts. Not with these implants. The host body seems to welcome them without incident. Their function and purpose, however, is yet to be understood. Dr. Lear passed away on March 14, 2014, the exact 20th anniversary of the Coronado events.
All of the abductees experienced episodes much later. Six months later, Mike Evans experienced visitations to his home in Simi Valley, California, and woke up with bruises on his arm. He was rushed to the hospital with heart attack-like symptoms due to the elevated blood pressure. The hypnosis of Mike Evans revealed he had had a lifetime of abduction encounters. Same was true of many of his six co-experiences. His magnetic resonance imaging revealed he had three apparent foreign bodies inside of his skull lodged into his brain. No medical professional has been ex able to explain what they are. The objects in his brain are one behind his ear, one on top of the limbic system, and one is in the occipital, which is responsible for our vision. They are not removable without a major surgery, so they're still there. There are other foreign objects in his legs lodged along the ridge of the tibia. These objects and his symptoms along with others are hard to fake. They do represent physical evidence of the events he has described, and no other explanation has been forthcoming. Lori Angeloni had no physical effects following the events, other than a triangular puncture mark. When examined by a doctor, it was found to be fluorescent, reflecting light when lit up. A few months later, however, she was hospitalized after, after suffering an anaphylactic shock. Mr. Baxter did not suffer immediately either. But months later, he was also hospitalized, feeling ill. He had to take leave from work for weeks with infection in his prostate and groin, which doctors could not explain. Do these collective experiences represent a smoking gun, proof of alien abduction? In the court of law, where circumstantial evidence and corroborative multiple eyewitness accounts are considered, it does. You can watch and listen to this and other podcasts on Project Blue Book and bluebook.tv, your safe and reliable source for exploring the unidentified and unexplained. Please subscribe, and each day, let's show some compassion and kindness. I am Thor, and thanks for listening. See you next time.